Not all organisms found in crops, forests, or landscapes are pests. Many organisms are beneficial. Others are of no consequence to the area being managed. However, a small number of organisms interfere with the availability, quality, or value of a managed resource. These organisms are called pests. For many pest species, a few individuals or light damage caused by their activities can be tolerated. But when organisms have intolerable negative effects, such as interfering with crop or animal production, damaging ornamental plantings, transmitting plant or animal disease, or are generally a nuisance, some management action must be taken. These can include insects and mites, pathogens, weeds, mollusks, nematodes, and vertebrates. I'm Dr. DeBus, and in this video, I will talk about the different types of pests. The same pest occurring in different parts of the country or in different crops may be called different names by people in the field. A good example is Helicoverpa zea, which is known as the corn earworm when it attacks corn, the tomato fruit worm when it attacks tomatoes, and the cotton bollworm when it attacks cotton. Multiple common names such as these can cause a great deal of confusion when trying to identify a pest or discuss it with an authority. To overcome this type of confusion, scientists use a unique two-word Latin name for each animal, plant, and microorganism species. In the case of the corn earworm, tomato fruitworm, cotton bollworm, the scientific name is Helicoverpa zea. The first word, Helicoverpa, is the genus or generic name, and it is capitalized. The second word, zea, is the specific name or specific epithet, and it is not capitalized. The genus and specific epithet combined form the species name. Both words are italicized or underlined and are in Latin so scientists can understand what plant or animal others are referring to regardless of language. It is still important to know the common names since growers, clients, and even pesticide labels often refer to these. There are several characteristics that make a successful pest. First, the pest can easily adapt to disturbed and variable environments. You can see this with weeds. This field bindweed is rapidly invading this field. The pest must have strong competitive abilities. In this nursery, weeds are actually growing on top of the ground cloth and have displaced the nursery plant in the pot. A successful pest has rapid reproduction. Aphids, such as these rose aphids, can produce as many as 12 live young a day without mating. Pests have good dispersal capabilities. Powdery mildew produces spores that disperse in the wind and affect a wide variety of hosts. Lastly, successful pests have good host finding capabilities. Not only can insects see the plants, some plant feeding insects can detect plant chemicals produced to hone in on the plant. I'm sure we've all experienced fruit flies a few hours after eating a banana. Arthropods Phylum arthropoda are organisms with an external skeleton and jointed body parts. The arthropod group includes six classes with members that are significant pests as well as several minor classes. Insects are by far the most abundant and diversified class of arthropods with 31 different orders. Spiders, ticks, and mites belong to the next largest class, the arachnid. Other major arthropod classes are the crustaceans, including sow bugs and pill bugs, the centipedes, and the millipedes. Insects have several distinctive characteristics. The adult insect has three body parts, the head, thorax, and abdomen. Three pairs of legs are attached to the thorax. Insects are the only invertebrates that have wings, but not all adult in insects have wings. If present, two pairs of wings are normal, although in a few groups such as true flies, one pair of wings has been greatly reduced. All insects have one pair of antenna on the front of the head. Mouth parts are useful in identifying insect pests. There are two main types of insect mouth parts, chewing and sucking. Sucking mouth parts vary in appearance. The mandibles are either lacking or form part of the proboscis. In many families, such as mosquitoes and aphids, there are two to six piercing structures called stylets that take up liquids from a plant or animal and inject saliva into the host to keep the flow going. The coil proboscis of a butterfly, on the other hand, does not pierce but is adapted for siphoning nectar and other liquids. Similarly, the mouth parts of certain flies are specialized to sponge up liquids. Thrips have primitive, rasping sucking mouth parts somewhat intermediate between chewing and sucking types. Piercing sucking insects, like the stink bug pictured here, have tubular mouth parts that they insert into the plant to suck up plant sap. 
Insects with these types of mouth parts cause leaves to curl or discolor. They often leave honeydew or sticky black excrement spots. They do not chew holes in leaves or other plant parts. There are many types of insects with sucking mouth parts. Some of the most common are pictured here. Aphids are small pear-shaped insects that feed on many plants and produce a lot of honeydew. Scale insects spend most of their lives hidden under a disc-like covering or scale. They have no visible antennae or legs and cannot move most of the time. There are two major groups of scales. Armored scales are smaller and flattened. Soft scales are more bulbous and produce honeydew. Scales are mostly pests of trees and shrubs. Mealybugs are waxy segmented insects that feed on a variety of plants and produce honeydew. Whiteflies are tiny insects. Adults have powdery white wings. Nymphs are oval and, like scales, don't move very much. Whiteflies usually occur in groups. Leafhoppers may cause yellow stippling on some plants, but usually do not cause serious damage. Here are some common insect pests with chewing mouth parts that you should learn to recognize. Caterpillars are the larvae or immatures of butterflies and moths. They come in many colors and sizes and may attack any succulent part of the plant, including leaves, buds, flowers, fruit, or roots. Earwigs have pinchers at their tail end, but these cannot hurt people. They feed on leaves, shoots, flowers, and soft fruit. The black vine weevil adult feeds on leaves on plants such as rhododendron. Its larvae feed on plant roots. Long grubs are the larvae of beetles such as the mass chafer. Grubs feed on turf fruits. Feeding can be so extensive that the lawn can be rolled up like a carpet. Grasshoppers feed on a variety of plants and usually aren't major pests except where landscapes are next to agricultural or uncultivated lands. Most arthropods hatch from eggs into immatures that increase in size by molting or shedding their outer body covering, exoskeleton, and growing a new larger one. Often they modify their shape with each successive molt, a process known as metamorphosis. The period between one molt and the next is known as an instar. Immature arthropods pass through several instars before becoming adults. Some species of insects undergo major morphological and structural changes between the immature stages and adulthood. This transformation occurs within a non-feeding pupil stage. These insects are said to have complete metamorphosis. Immatures in these groups are called larvae and in many cases have different feeding habits from adults, so that only either the larval or adult stage causes damage. Examples of insects with complete metamorphosis includes flies, wasps, moths, butterflies, and beetles. Other insects such as grasshoppers, aphids, and true bugs go through gradual or incomplete metamorphosis and do not have a pupil stage. Their immatures are called nymphs. They differ from adults primarily in their size and absence of wings. Adults and immatures of these insects have the same food habits. Here are some other invertebrates that occur in landscapes that you should be able to recognize. These include ants, which serve many beneficial functions in the landscape, such as eating some pests, but they also can be pests, especially when they protect aphids and other insects from their natural enemies. Snails and slugs are mollusks. They chew irregular holes in leaves and other succulent plant parts. They often feed at night, but leave a silvery trail of mucus behind. Spider mites are very tiny arachnids, which cause speckling on leaves. When there are a lot of them, they often leave webbing which is how they get their name, spider mites. Here's a bit more on mites. Mites differ from insects in that they have two body parts and no antennae. Mites usually have four pairs of legs that are attached to the abdomen. Some immature forms and a few adults only have three pairs. Mites are very small and as a group, very diverse in form and habits. You can learn to identify major groups of mites, which is helpful because mites within a family often have similar habits and management options. Features used in the field to, as identification clues include host plant, mite size, shape, and color, the presence and pattern of spots or spines, the number of legs, and the timing, location, and grouping of egg laying. The most common pest groups are the spider mites and red mites and areophyid mites. The best known predatory mite species are found in the family Phytoceidae. Weeds are unwanted plants in the landscape. There are many, many weed species, but they can all be classified into one of three major groups. Broadleaves have wide to narrow leaves with net-like veins. Grasses have narrow 
leaves with ranged in sets of two. Stems are rounded or flattened. Sedges look like grasses. However, their leaves and flowers are arranged in sets of three and their stems are triangular in cross-section. The saying is that sedges have edges, which refers to the triangular stems. Weeds can be grouped according to their life cycles as annuals, biannuals, or perennials. Annual weeds grow, reproduce, and die within one growing season. Annuals reproduce by seed only. Depending on the time of year that they begin growth, annuals are divided into two groups, summer annuals and winter annuals. Summer annuals germinate in the spring, they flower and produce seed in, in mid to late summer, and die in the fall. Some common summer annuals include pigweed, crabgrass, spotted spurge, and Florida pusley. Winter annuals germinate from late summer to early winter, but they may not grow very much until the temperature warms towards the end of winter. They flower and reproduce seed in mid to late spring and die in the early summer. Henbet, annual bluegrass, Carolina geranium, and chickweed are, are examples of winter annuals. Biannuals are plants that usually require two growing seasons to complete their life cycle. Shepherd's purse is an example of a biannual. Perennials produce vegetative structures that allow them to live for three years or longer. Some species live indefinitely. Examples include yellow nutsedge, oxalis, dandelion, and Bermuda grass. Many perennials lose their leaves or die back entirely during the winter, but regrow each spring from roots or underground storage organs. Yellow nutsedge has tubers which grow from roots. Oxalis has bulbs. New plants emerge from the bulbs each year. Bermuda grass has stolons and rhizomes, which are above ground and below ground stems. Most perennials can also reproduce by seed. Woody plants such as trees, shrubs, and vines are perennial and under certain circumstances are considered weeds, such as poison oak, mimosa tree, and balsam apple. Vertebrates are animals with internal skeletons and backbones. They include fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. A vertebrate pest is any native, introduced, domestic, or feral vertebrate species that has a short-term or long-term adverse effect on human health and well-being, destroys food, fiber, or natural resources, or is a general nuisance. Common vertebrate pests include commensal rats and mice, voles, bats, skunks, possums, rabbits, squirrels, moles, pocket gophers, deer, and birds. Identification of vertebrate pest species can be relatively easy if the species doing the damage is observed, but in most situations this does not occur. Damage is usually observed when the culprit is nowhere in sight. Fortunately, vertebrate pests typically leave behind signs such as tracks, tooth marks, droppings, dens, burrows, and trails. These signs, coupled with the familiarity of the habits of vertebrates, can aid in identifying the species. Plant diseases can be caused by many microorganisms, including viruses, fungi, and bacteria. These disease-causing organisms are called plant pathogens. Fungi obtain nutrients from living or dead plant or animal material. They do not have the ability to carry out photosynthesis. Fungi are mostly microscopic, but some, like mushrooms, are identifiable without magnification. The body of a fungus is composed of tubular filaments called hyphae, and it reproduces by spores. Symptoms can include blights, cankers, root rots, leaf spots, and many others. Bacteria are microscopic one-celled organisms. Symptoms may include wilting, leaf spots and blights, and crown gall. A virus is an obligate parasite of sub-microscopic size that is composed of genetic material and surrounded by a layer of protein. Viruses are often vectored by other pests such as aphids, leafhoppers, whiteflies, nematodes, and fungi. Symptoms may include mosaic patterns, deformed leaves, and stunting. For a pathogen to attack a plant, the plant and pathogen must come in contact with one another and interact. Plant and pathogen are often present and in contact, but disease does not develop, either because the host is resistant to attack or the pathogen is unable to attack due to unfavorable environmental conditions for disease development. These three components, host plant, causal agent, and a conducive environment, are known as the disease triangle. If any of the sides is absent or unfavorable, the disease will not develop. Nematodes are unsegmented roundworms that can be found in soil, water, plant tissues, or animals. They feed on a diversity of organisms, including plants, insects, and animals. Most plant parasitic 
Nematodes pierce roots and can't be seen without a microscope. A few attack above ground parts such as the alfalfa stem nematode. Other nematodes are beneficial. Symptoms above ground may include stunting, chlorosis or yellowing, or leaf drop. Often the damage is patchy as seen in the soybean field. Below ground roots include galls, lesions, or stunted roots. Root knot nematode causes galling of the roots of many plant species. The female remains sedentary inside the roots and produces eggs. Confirmation of nematodes requires a nematode assay at a laboratory. Because the microorganisms causing plant diseases are so small, it is often difficult to identify the cause of the injury in the field. Microorganisms often live inside the plant and cause general symptoms such as wilting that can be caused by a variety of organisms or abiotic factors. Some plant pathogens can only be seen with a microscope or may require a laboratory test to positively identify them. You may need to take samples to your extension office or to other experts to diagnose the cause. In conclusion, I hope you learned some of the different types of pests that cause problems in plants.